Hi, welcome. I'm glad you're here today. This month in November, we're celebrating Mission Month, and our focus this year is particularly on homelessness. It's been in the news over the past two years, and members of our congregation has really tried to drill down to see what we can do to address that deep-felt need. It's uh, added new life to the relationships we've had with longtime mission partners like Yorba Linda Food for Families. We've increased our donation to what we give to them and found a way to give what really matters to them. Every time we bring something by, they tell us how grateful they are that we fill that particular need of toilet paper, diapers, and wipes. We've also grown in our relationship with Habitat for Humanity, and you'll hear a little bit more about that next week. But the most exciting development in our continuing mission partners is that with his OC. In today's Moment for Mission, Karen Sai will give you the latest on that. It's been so exciting. But we've also developed a couple new mission partnerships. One is with CityNet, which contracts with different cities throughout Orange County to partner with them and law enforcement to help get people off the streets. Julia McKelly is doing an internship at CityNet, and we're so excited to have an inside person there to help us know how we can engage and support the work that they do. We also have a new partnership with United to End Homelessness. That's the group that's put on the Homelessness 101 classes that many of us have attended, and they have other educational events as well. They're hosting some things for National Hunger and Homeless Awareness Week, which is coming up right now. So we'll be sending an email out to you this week to help you learn a little more. I think you'll be encouraged to learn that we really can make a difference. It is possible to solve the problem of homelessness in Orange County. Other communities around the nation have done it. Even the whole state of Utah has done it. And so can we. As we anticipate a celebration of Thanksgiving, I've been thinking that it's not just a holiday. It can also be a spiritual practice, one that I really need to engage in, especially as I get frustrated with all the ways that our life is different right now than it used to be. So uh, I'm gonna share with you what I am thankful for. And I hope that will help you get excited with me about all the great things that God is doing in our congregation. Today, I'm thankful for our mission committee. They pivoted and were able to think outside the box as we got ready for mission month. The um, being forced to change what we've done before allowed us to kill a couple sacred cows and we decided to throw a barbecue. So we had our supersized drive-by drop-off. We've also done our alternative Christmas market a little differently than we have before. We've been happy to leave some of those traditions behind, but we've also persisted until we found new ways to keep our most valued mission connections. I'm so proud of the men and women on that mission committee for the way they helped make something new happen. And it's been exciting to watch our mission partnerships grow over the last months. I'm also grateful for the men who serve on our facilities committee. All along, we've been talking about how they volunteered to do daily campus checks at the beginning of the shutdown, and that lasted for many months. When we were without electricity, they took turns watering the lawn, which was a chore that took three or four hours. Once the electricity was back on, Mike Jacobs and Shane were very careful to fix stuff that broke while we didn't have power. And they've got our HVAC running in the sanctuary, which will allow us to gather safely in there. More than that, they've found ways to offer gracious hospitality to our community. We've welcomed a Boy Scout troop while they were homeless. They help us set up tables and chairs so that we can host events for our congregation, but also for the broader community, even sharing our parking lot with UPS crews and construction crews. Not only do they care for and protect our beautiful campus, they see it as an opportunity to offer God's gracious welcome to the people in our community. It's a beautiful thing. 
and it is a sign of a vital congregation. Well done. This next song Janet has prepared is one of my favorites as we approach Thanksgiving. It's a reminder that all we have is from God and that God's generosity is constant and vast. There's one lyric that caught my attention today. Now direct our daily labor, lest we strive for self alone. Part of what worship does in us each week is to recalibrate our perspective so that it's more in line with the values of the kingdom of God. This song begins some of that work in our hearts, drawing the focus of our daily efforts beyond ourselves so that others might be blessed. Good morning, children of God. Imagine it is Christmas morning and under the tree is a brand new guitar. It's the one you've always wanted. You take it out of its case, you admire it, you run your fingers over the strings. Then 
you put it back into its case because you don't want anything to happen to it. You never play it. It stays in your room, eventually collecting dust. Do you think the person who gave you that gift would be very happy knowing you never even played that guitar? Probably not. But imagine if you opened the guitar and immediately started playing it. The whole family gathers around, the around you and the whole room is filled with your beautiful music. You take the guitar everywhere with you. At work, you play your guitar on your lunch break, drawing a crowd who enjoys your music. And later, you visit an uncle in a nursing home. And soon, the nurses come in, and before you know it, everyone is singing along to your music. Do you think the gift giver would be happy with you now? Probably. You have used your gift to bring joy to others. In today's parable, Jesus reminds us about how to use the gifts God gives us. Some of us are good at caring for others. Some are good with money. Others can sing, and some people can make others laugh. We should not waste God's gifts. We need to use our gifts and share them with others so they can keep on giving and giving and giving. And all God's children say, Amen. Listen to the word of the Lord. Then Jesus told this parable, for it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded for them to make five more talents. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and buried the master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came to settle accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing his five talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I made five more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents came forward, also saying, master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I made two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying, master, I knew you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the 10 talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please come with me in prayer. Shine your light on your word, O Lord. By your spirit, let us see your wonder. For your justice outruns our sense of fairness. Your love extends beyond what we can imagine. 
open our eyes, unstop our ears, and show us your good way. For Jesus' sake, amen. Today we're at the midpoint of our study of Matthew 25. Jesus is telling a string of parables crafted to instruct those who follow him how to live as wise and faithful Christians until he comes again. Each of the parables begins with wild and abundant gifts given by God. You can see it when you read Matthew 24 and 25 as a whole unit. One servant is put in charge of all the resources of an entire household. All ten bridesmaids are invited to a grand wedding banquet. Three servants are each given astronomical sums to invest. But each parable includes dire consequences for those who choose not to embrace the gift. A wicked servant is cut into pieces. Bridesmaids are left out in the cold. A lazy servant is cast into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus' parables are known for their colorful and compelling language, and these certainly grab our attention. Jesus will come again to judge the quick and the dead. And if we end up on the wrong side of that judgment, the consequences are terrible. So the question we bring to today's text is this. What does it look like to be faithful with what God has given to us? Let's see how today's parable informs our answer to that question. It begins with a very rich man leaving for what will turn out to be a very long journey. He gathers three of his servants and gives each of them a portion of his wealth. Now, he had other options. He could have put all his money in the bank to keep it safe, but he didn't. He chose to trust it to the care of these three servants. To the first, he gave five talents, to the next, two, and to the third, he gave one talent. Now, a talent is a huge sum of money. A talent was equal to about 6,000 denarii. And since one denarius was a common laborer's daily wage, a talent would be roughly equivalent to 20 years' wages of the average worker. Five talents, the largest number entrusted to any of the servants, is about 100 years' pay. That pencils out to roughly $10 million, depending on how much you pay your servants. Now, a story about winning the lottery is a great way to grab an audience's attention, but this is a parable. So if we make those talents just about money, we're probably going to miss the point. It helps that because of its use in the original King James version of this passage, the word talent began to be used in the English language to mean aptitude or ability, a capacity for success or achievement. But even that definition is probably too narrow. The talents we have been given by God include all of it. The money we have, the abilities that help us succeed, and all the other gifts we have received from God's hand, including the grace that saves us from sin and death and welcomes us into God's kingdom. Do you see it? Each of the servants was given a lifetime supply of grace. The first two servants got it right. They used the resources they are given wisely and faithfully. They took a risk investing their master's money and they doubled it. When he returned, he praised them. Well done, good and faithful servants. This part of the parable flows along so smoothly, it's easy for us to miss the point. Why is it, exactly, that the master is pleased with the first two servants? 
It's not for what they preached or believed about God. Neither one of them made fine speeches about how, even though the master is away, they have faith that he will return one day. It's not for their strict obedience to clear instructions. The master didn't give any instructions. He basically said, here, hold this for me, and took off. The first two were praised and rewarded for their active responsibility with what had been given to them. They took what was given and put it to work. They took initiative and risk. They lived with a joyful expectation of abundance. And for that, their master praised them. Then we come to the third servant. And here's where the parable starts to pick up some speed. By word count alone, this is the guy that we're supposed to pay attention to. Add the weeping and gnashing of teeth, which any sensible Christian is keen to avoid, and you've got an audience's attention. Jesus wants to give us something to chew on, and somebody has to get it wrong to show us how to get it right. Given the smallest portion of this huge responsibility, servant number three freaks out. He's so afraid of his master's reputation, none of which is ever confirmed, by the way, that he buries the gift that has been given to him. Well, now the master's mad. You wicked and lazy servant. You should have put the money in the bank where you would have at least made a little interest. And this poor guy, along with those five bridesmaids who thought they needed lit lamps to get into the party, He's thrown into the outer darkness. The way I read this parable was forever changed by an experience I had in youth group. The kids were invited to turn this parable into a play. Scott, who was playing the third servant, gave an award-worthy performance, weeping and gnashing his teeth to break your heart. The other kids in the group laughed and applauded him, and Scott reveled in the glory of his 15 minutes of fame. Anna, who was playing the master, could not bring herself to kick him into the outer darkness. She just couldn't bear to stick to the script. Turns out the kid had an instinct for the gospel. Instead, she chased Scott through the youth lounge, reaching out her hand, pleading with him to come back into the fold and enter into the joy. Joy! Joy! She kept crying, chasing after him as as if she were offering him life-saving medicine, which, of course, she was. But Scott was having so much fun with his performance, weeping and gnashing his teeth, he would have none of it. If the master in the parable is Jesus, then Anna's improvisation is more like the Jesus we have come to expect. After all, the servant didn't break any rules. He basically did what was asked of him, and yet when the master returns, he's upset. And if that third servant was guilty, the punishment certainly doesn't seem to fit the crime. So how can we get from what this parable seems to teach to what we know to be true of the gospel? Maybe you know me well enough by now to know that I prefer to preach God's grace over God's judgment. But even I can't wiggle out of this one. These parables make it very clear that Jesus intends to judge us for our actions for our response to the grace he has given us so freely, so abundantly. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But there will be consequences if the lives we live don't reflect the amazing grace we have received. So, What do we learn from this text about what it looks like to be faithful 
with what God has given us. Like the parable of the ten bridesmaids that comes before it, this one seems to come down to what we believe about the one who offers us grace. The first two servants gladly received the ridiculous, abundant blessing their master had placed in their hands. They joyfully and ambitiously put it to work. They weren't afraid. They were hopeful, maybe even a little bit reckless. They were certainly ready to take a risk. Their actions reveal what they believe about their master. They are praised as good and faithful, invited to enter into the joy of their master because they were already there. They were already living joyfully. The actions of the third servant reveal what he believed too. Rather than embracing the grace he had been given, he refused it. He expected weeping and gnashing of teeth and that's what he got. He was afraid believing his master to be a harsh man. So he buried the riches that had been placed in his hands. And by burying the talent, he buried himself. The door to the joy of his master was wide open. He just refused to walk through it. This is true for each one of us too. God has given us a ridiculous amount of grace, wealth that we can share, abilities that contribute to the work of God's kingdom, love and care to embrace others, salvation from sin that frees us to joyful obedience. We don't have to wait until we die to experience the joy of Christ's kingdom. We don't have to wait until Jesus comes again. Jesus told us that the kingdom of God is already in our midst. We can experience that joy now. We do it by living according to the ethic of God's kingdom. We can live with generosity rather than a sense of scarcity. We can live showing mercy and forgiveness rather than judgment. And we can live every single day with a clear-eyed gratitude for the amazing, abundant grace God has showered on us, even in the midst of difficult times. The joy of the kingdom has already been placed in our hands. What we do with it reveals what we believe about Jesus Christ. What are you good at? What talents has God given you? Share it. That's your chance to learn one of the most amazing things about God's grace. When you share it, it grows. Amen. God's giving knows no ending. And what we do with the grace that we have received from God matters. Christ's call to us today is to share what we have been given with joy, with reckless abandon. Whether that's the money in our bank accounts or the time that we give to care for those in need. Mike and Karen are going to tell you a little more about that. God has entrusted us with a variety of gifts. Though the way we give is different these days, our need to give has not changed. We return to the Lord a generous measure of our bounty with thanksgiving and praise. Please pray with me. For all that you are, and all that you do, we give you thanks, dear God. We wait in hope for your coming and offer those gifts to further your kingdom on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. His House is a program we're all very familiar with. 
And YLPC has supported over the years, both with volunteers and with giving. This year, I have learned so much about this outstanding program and all that it is doing for those who really need mentoring and support to help them find their way to successfully live and work in our community. Last fall, Haley Cooper, the development manager of his house, spoke to my PEO meeting and I was so impressed with what she had to say and what the program offered that I really wanted to take a tour of the house. Then COVID hit, everything turned around. Now it is during this time frame that several things have come to me in an aha moment though. So COVID has been a blessing in a way for my understanding about what his house offers. His house has many programs available to people who need their help. Also, we have many caring people here at YLPC who do help and can help the homeless. And I also learned a lot about how important it is to have active outreach for our young families and young members of the church. This is very important to them. Now, how did my aha moment come about? Well, suddenly in mid-March, my husband and I received a phone call from our daughter and her husband in New York City. After talking with us, they decided that they were going to fly home to California and settle in out here, which they did. They were working virtually with their jobs in New York, but they really wanted to do some of the outreach and volunteering here that they had been doing in New York City. So they started looking for opportunities that might come available for them to do this kind of volunteering. And one day my daughter talked to me and she said, mom, do you know anything about his house? I said, yes, enthusiastically. I said, our church supports his house. What are you interested in doing? Well, she talked about us serving meals to the his house residents and staff. And so that was arranged and women from the Bible study at YLPC and members of the Mission Commission all joined in and together we served meals for nine weeks to members, to the residents of his house and the workers. My family provided the main entree for most of the meals. And then all the other members of the church that were helping provided some of the most delicious sides and the best desserts ever. And the people that lived at his house were so thrilled to have this food coming. Now, every week as we got the meals ready, people would come to our house and drop the food off at the front door. And then at a safe and social distance, we were able to chat a little bit. So it was a blessing to be serving these meals because we had an opportunity to stay in touch with each other and to do something that was really very helpful in the community. On the flip side, the people that live at his house were so excited to have the meals and one day, a couple of the teenage boys that were living there came running to the door to say, thank you, thank you, thank you for these delicious meals. They were so excited that we were bringing them to them. So it was really a wonderful experience for all of us that participated in it. Now, through the spring and into the summer, many at YLPC learned about how his house was expanding its programming. And YLPC was very supportive for the spring, fu spring fundraiser and for the summer camp out. And, and it was during this time, a big change occurred with his house. They changed their name. They changed it to his OC to reflect the fact that they were moving from just the original farmhouse in Placentia to other new locations around the area. So it is his OC that we will call it from here on. Now, the new program that they started in Placentia is called Franklin House. It is a home for young men ages 18 to 24, and it is a home that is helping them find their way to becoming stable and getting a job and going back to school for some kind of training. It is a work study program and all the men that go to this house are required to both work and study. So at the moment, they have five residents 
with three more moving in over the next week. And they only opened latter part of August and early September. But all of these young men were men living on the streets. They were homeless and some were even living on the railroad tracks. But the program is individualized and it provides mentoring that is tailor-made to the needs of each young man. So if you have a man that has not finished high school, he works and he studies to get his GED. If you have a young man that um, has the GED, well, then they go and they find work or a job training program or classes at local colleges in Fullerton and the Cerritos area. Now, the great news is only two and a half months into this program, there are already success stories. One of them, a young man, was reunited with his birth father. He hadn't seen him for a long time. He's now living with his father and he has a job working for an air conditioning company. His success was accomplished in just 45 days. Another young man who was 21 years old was living on the streets and was doing drugs. He went to AA, he is now sober, and he goes to church regularly, and he just got his first paycheck. There's a third young man who was able to get all of his documents together, and he was sworn in to join the Navy this week on Tuesday. So fantastic, isn't it? I was so excited to hear this news from um, Christina Stolino, who's one of the people that is coordinating Franklin House. Now, eventually, the young men who go through the program at Franklin House, they have two years, and when they successfully complete it, then they are eligible to become part of another new program called, um, I forget what the name is, sorry, a home share program, sorry. And this program will pair them with senior citizens in the community that have a room available to rent. And part of the payment to the senior citizen is to help them with their grocery shopping, and their appointments that they need to go to, as well as just to be a companion. There are so many ways your Belinda Presbyterian Church can support Franklin House. And what they need now are working desktop computers and tall dressers. They need gift cards for fast foods and for Walmart and for haircuts because they use this in an incentive program with the men. And they need, they need men's shoes and underwear. And they need a van in good working order so that the people that staff Franklin House can help drive the men to the appointments that they have and to run and get all the documentation like copies of their social security cards and their, their ID from the DMV. So if you're interested in doing any of that, please contact me because I can give you more information. In the meantime, I have to say, I am so pleased that YLPC has already been supporting such an important program as his of OC. The families and young men who use these services there are so grateful for the help that they are getting. And this is the kind of active involvement our younger church members are so excited to be a part of, and I'm sure you are too.
in peace, to love and serve the Lord joyfully. And as you go, may the gifts of the Holy Spirit be yours. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be yours, and may the love of God Almighty be yours, now and forever. Amen.